high-speed police chases and wanton and reckless driving on the part of police kill hundreds of people, including law enforcement officials, alleged criminals, as well as innocent civilians every year in the United States. While authorities are engaged in high-speed police chases or pursuits, there can be complete disregard for the safety of other drivers as officers continue the chase well after the danger outweighs the need to apprehend the suspect. More people in the United States are killed by high-speed pursuits and wanton and reckless driving by the police than they are by police firearms. And yet these wrongful deaths from car accidents will likely continue year after year. That is why two-thirds of those injured or killed in fatal car accidents stemming from police chases or pursuits are innocent drivers and pedestrians that have nothing to do with the chase. In this insider-exclusive Justice in America Network TV special, our news team goes behind the headlines in Justice in America, Melanie Gilliland's story to visit with Joseph Tomasek, Melanie Gilliland's lawyer. As we take you inside today's legal system, examining Joe's legal strategies and his client's thoughts, and in vivid detail, showing you the often heartbreaking stories of cases like his client, Melanie Gilliland. These victims could be you or me one day. And if you are so unlucky, you will quickly find out that justice in America is a hard-won battle where very few defendants ever do the right thing, and you need experienced trial lawyers like Joseph Tomasek at the law firm of Joseph E. Tomasek who wage these battles with their financial resources to get their clients justice. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Berkeley, California. It is my great pleasure to introduce Joe Tomasek to the show. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Steve. Let's talk about your firm. What do you? What does your firm specialize in? I've been a solo practitioner for over thirty years, and I specialize primarily in personal injury, uh, mainly auto collisions, but also premises liability, insurance, bad faith, and uh, also I now have a crossover case involving injury and disability access rights, ADA, that type of thing. So basically you represented the little guy in all these cases, right? Absolutely. Against the major corporations. But you originally, when you came into the legal industry after you graduated law school, you went to work for an insurance company so you could see how they work, right? Absolutely. Well, we're actually for a law firm that represented insurance companies. So about uh, five, six years of doing insurance defense and got to know the ropes and uh, know how they operate. and. I um, felt in my heart that I really uh, enjoyed and uh, felt more fulfilled by representing a little guy or gal, and I switched over to the plant side. Yeah, it is very useful to know both sides of the mentality of both sides there. My question is, what did you see on the defense side that you didn't particularly like? So when I was doing insurance defense for insurance companies, I just wasn't very happy with how they treated people. Uh, I mean, uh, obviously, you can't be expected to give away the store, but they just weren't very reasonable. A lot of times they wanted documents shredded uh, that shouldn't have been shredded, and I refused to do it. And I just uh, didn't feel comfortable with um, how they um, took care of people and how they um, cared about people. So we are here today because one of your clients is Melanie Gilliland, right? Yes. Tell our audience who she is and how she came to your office and how you're, what, what's going on with the case. Melanie was a sweet woman. She was in retail for many years and she was uh, essentially retired, living with her sister and her dogs, beloved dogs and her pets. And um, she was an uh, innocent victim of uh, a botched traffic stop by a police officer. What exactly happened? What happened was is that <clears throat> a police officer was uh, investigating a parking lot and um, for burglaries and suspected a burglary happened. He had a uh, potential vehicle uh, full of um, what he thought was burglars um, boxed into a parking lot and wanted to uh, apprehend them. And he got scared. He, um, instead of uh, turning his lights and sirens on again in the PA and telling him to get out, he moved his car out of the way and then let them out of the parking lot. Okay, and then he chased after them. And what happened was is that the um, vehicle that he suspected of being burglars slowly drove past him. And as it was exiting the vehicle, the officer whipped a U-turn, and when the occupants uh, uh, saw that 
uh, quick U-turn, they got scared and they started speeding down the hill towards a, a busy intersection. Yeah, the, if I remember correctly, the speed was about 41 miles an hour. Is that right? Right, the, the officer speed, it was a 25 mile hour speed limit. He did not have his siren on, correct? Didn't have his lights on, didn't have his sirens on. And um, because he was basically chasing this car, going pursuing the car, um, it ran an intersection, correct? Well, it's interesting you bring a pursuit because Pursuit has a special legal term. He's claiming he wasn't pursuing it. Right, he claims he wasn't pursuing. And what happened was, is we believe that this was, and we're um, alleging this was a botched traffic stop. So pursuit under the uh, city's um, code is uh, trying to apprehend a uh, suspect, you know, uh, arrest them. Um, he claims he wasn't even trying to do a traffic stop. At least he claimed that deposition. But fortunately, uh, we were able to obtain the body cam video right after the incident. And he said repeatedly, I was trying to do a traffic stop. I don't think I had my lights and sirens on. So he just forgot to put lights and sirens on, and that was the problem. Right. Uh, in the beginning of the show, we have shown what you provided us from the perspective of the officer's car. And if I remember correctly, it shows that he has pulled out his weapon. Occupants that vehicle, don't move! Don't move! Get your hands up! Do not move! You understand? If you move, you will be shot! So they started accelerating downhill, like I said, and there was cars coming across and they didn't stop and I didn't, I honestly don't remember if I had my lights on or not. I don't even think I had even done that yet. I was just putting out radio traffic and trying to catch up to them. Okay. And they just, you know, went straight down the hill. For sure your sirens were not ringing. For sure it was not. Yeah. If, if anything, I had my lights on. activity and I didn't know what was happening and so I was trying to make a vehicle stop. They well, what happened was is that there's a body cam video of the collision and then there's more body cam video right after and um, he pulled out his weapon and said something to the effect of don't move or I'll shoot which was very odd because he said he was back in the parking lot when he let his vehicle out of the parking lot he said he was afraid to confront them where after the collision occurred uh, he didn't appear to be uh, afraid to confront them at all. The car that he was pursuing smashed into your client's car. Yes. And, and tell our audience a little bit about her injuries. So what happened was is that um, upon impact, a very violent uh, broadside impact, her intestines were shredded and she had massive internal bleeding and uh, she was mostly unconscious at the scene. They took her to emergency room hospital. They uh, performed emergency surgery to try to save her life. She had a uh, massive blood loss. And unfortunately, they had to take out the most important portions of her intestines, the uh, terminal ileum and the ileocecal valve. And these are the parts of the intestines that are crucial for absorbing nutrients, um, uh, vitamin uh, B, and that type of thing. And now she has permanent uh, major digestive problems for the rest of her life. For the rest of her life. And what is her state right now? Right now, she's not doing well and she's getting worse. Um, she is constantly, um, uh, has constant nausea, uh, constant fatigue, um, bloating. She has to uh, chop her food into little bits. She has to eat very bland, um, limited uh, aspects of food. She can drink uh, liquids with her uh, meals. And it's a uh, complete loss of enjoyment of food. But even beyond that, constant pain, constant uh, nausea and weakness. Her skin is so um, dehydrated that if she bumps into something, she'll get cuts and bruises. And uh, she often loses control of her bowels at night, has to change the sheets. It's, it's just awful. We have a little clip of that. We're gonna go to that right now. When your traffic signal turned green, if you had heard or seen emergency lights or police siren, would you have stayed stopped? Yes. What was the first thing you recall after waking up from the collision? Yeah, when I, when I woke up at the hospital, I remember them telling me that, well, my sisters were there and they were telling me that I had um, had such an intense internal bleeding that I died on the table and they had to go in and give me a, a bunch of blood. I forget how much, but it was a ton of blood because I had lost so much blood. So then they were able to bring me back and then they had to go in, I think two more times. And then they put me in, a, in an induced coma. Remember them telling me that. And then um, 
I got information that my bowels had been shredded and that they had to remove most of my short bowels. And also that I had had whiplash and my collarbone was broken. And uh, that's kind of what I remember, you know, it's an in and out thing. Oh, and then they also had to put me on uh, vein feeding. I know that there was tubes all over me and they were feeding me through my veins. What type of symptoms and conditions do you still have from well, the collision? Uh, nausea for sure. Day, I fight daily nausea. Um, I also have a lot of trouble around eating because um, it's, I guess it's hard for me to digest, but uh, when I eat, I get hungry, but when I eat after that, I know I'm gonna get nauseous, right? And then I also have a lot of gas build up, a lot of bloat, a lot of diarrhea, incontinence with the diarrhea. Um, and I, when I eat, I can't like drink fluids, although I am stay dehydrated because of the short bowel syndrome, I can't really absorb fluids. So um, I have to massively drink water in between meals. Um, and then I get severe bouts of diarrhea and I have to be very conscious about the um, the diarrhea because I can get incontinence with it. What is the current state of the case now? Um, we've been sent for trial several times, but because of COVID and other issues, it's uh, the trial date's been continued uh, a few times. It's currently set for trial September 11th. Uh, and we're going forward against both the um, uh, city, uh, the police department, and the other driver who was um, uh, basically uh, 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 frightened uh, to try to run the yellow light. Because he felt what, the driver? The driver just wanted to get away from the officer. He was uh, African-American and had a lot of bad uh, experiences with the police in the past. And um, he wasn't sure what the officer was doing. He saw a car speeding behind him and um, no license sirens. So he didn't know if the police were trying to go around him or um, uh, stop him. He was you know, confused and perplexed and he was also frightened. So he saw a yellow light and just wanted to get it as far away from the officer as possible. Unfortunately, he didn't make the, uh, the yellow light and ran a red light. So the police's position right now is that they were not chasing her, uh, him, right? right? And he smashed into the car and it's all between him and uh, your client, correct? Right. The police are trying to blame the uh, other driver, the 18-year-old uh, kid. And uh, obviously, that driver has some fault for misjudging the light. But uh, there's a doctrine called inducement. When um, someone is uh, being followed at high speeds by an officer, by a patrol car, without uh, the, a patrol car's lights and sirens on, um, the person who's being um, followed at high speeds gets confused, gets frightened, and continues to speed. It's just a psychological phenomena that is instinct and reactions. And uh, officer either uh, knew this and didn't care or didn't know this. And um, uh, this, uh, you know, obviously it's a botched traffic stop. When you're, when you're trying to do a traffic stop, you have to have your license and on. That's just basic police conduct that's in the, um, uh, all the uh, police uh, training manuals and uh, uh, guidelines. And you know when you're chasing, and when you're trying to stop someone for a traffic stop, you need to alert them uh, by putting your license and sirens on. But as important, if not more important, you're warning other motorists, other pedestrians that um, their vehicles traveling at high speeds, and they need to be wary. If the officer had put the license and sirens on, Ms. Gilland almost certainly would have heard the lights, uh, seen the lights, and heard the lights and sirens, and um, not going into the intersection and this collision never would have happened. And more importantly, yeah, he, the officer would have notified by his actions, everybody there was a pursuit happening. Of course, he claims there's no pursuit, correct? And, and then that gets into the issue of immunities. The immunities in this area um, are very complicated. The laws changed over time. I talked to many attorneys who said, um, you know, uh, it, it's not uh, going to be a very difficult case because of immunities, immunities will probably apply. But uh, I'm surprised at how many attorneys didn't have a proper grasp of uh, police immunities. And the law has changed uh, and there has been a compromise. It could get better. 
and hopefully in the future the law will get better for um, the citizens. Well, let's talk, let's talk about the immunity law. Let's talk about police pursuit immunity. What is exactly the law in this jurisdiction? Well, we'll take a whole couple more shows to go through all of it, but briefly, um, uh, pursuit immunity under the uh, uh, vehicle code is that um, there is immunity if the um, officer is intending to do a police pursuit. The definition of police pursuit is um, somewhat unclear using uh, the city's definition in this case. It's trying to apprehend a known suspect. But you have to have your lights and siren on, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. With no lights and siren on, what is that called? Um, they are, the, the, the police department in this case was trying to say that they were just um, following them in general. But um, I'm, we're alleging that it was a, a, a traffic stop, a botched traffic stop. And the officer did admit that in the body cam video. And he went to deposition and under oath testified he absolutely was not trying to do a traffic stop, that he um, never told anyone he was trying to do a traffic stop, but we got him saying repeatedly, I was trying to do a traffic stop. So clearly he's either got a really bad memory or trying to cover up. And um, uh, so you also, an officer can also have, um, or any um, emergency vehicle can have immunity if the lights and sirens are on, but obviously that wasn't this case. There also can be immunity if the uh, person uh, being followed believes they're being pursued, and that's the main crux of this case. Problem for the police department is the um, kid testified uh, under oath at his deposition that he did not believe he was being pursued because the lights and sirens were not on. And has the city offered any kind of settlement? No. That's generally their position, right? Let's go to trial. It seems apparent to me that uh, the city and the police department know that they're gonna be liable for all the economic damages in this case. In California, the non-economic damages are divided by a proportion of fault. But um, any defendant who has any liability is completely liable for the economic damages. And um, they're gonna be probably at least $2 million of future medical treatment. Ms. Gillen needs um, monthly B12 shots, needs constant mi monitoring, constant bone scans, visits with a GI specialist, um, and um, she's probably gonna have to have organ replacement because uh, she has short bowel syndrome, and that causes a lot of uh, collateral damage in the body, and um, she's having uh, gallstones, kidney stones, might have to have um, gallbladder replaced, might have to have the kidneys replaced. This is going to be more than $2 million, isn't it? We'll see. You know, it's, that, that's, the, that's the debate right now. Let me ask you something. Let's say, you know, not this case, but let's say you settle a case or you go to trial and you get a verdict, but additional medical issues come up as a result of, let's say, this accident or whatever. Can Is it done and final that you can't go back and claim that it's related to the previous accident and get more compensation for your client? Absolutely. When you settle a case, it is final. I mean, virtually every time. And that's why you know a good attorney will make sure to tell the jury at the end of um, the trial, this is our only chance at justice. This is our one chance to get full justice for this person who's going to suffer for the rest of their life. And um, just uh, because it's surprising, some juries believe that they can't come back for more. And it's important to make sure that you, uh, um, you know, inform the juries that this is their only chance. And if they don't give them enough money to last the rest of their life, then justice will not be done. Right. Um, you have handled a lot of cases like this, similar or like this, personal injury cases and that sort of thing. How do you select your clients? What, what rings the bell when a client comes in with a case? I have to have a personal connection with that client. Um, I mean, no one's going to be perfect. I'm not perfect. They're not perfect. But I have to uh, believe that uh, generally they're a good person, that uh, they're deserving of um, uh, justice in this case, both the facts of the case and also being a good person as well. So um, I have to kind of connect with them on a personal level. And I uh, just have to believe that uh, also that there's at least a shot of significant liability on the alleged defendant. And it's funny because I've taken a lot of cases that other attorneys said I was foolish to take and got phenomenal results. And there's been many cases where, uh, in California, the um, conclusions of the reporting officer are not generally not admissible into evidence. What, why, why, I'm just curious, why is that? Statute. So California statute says because it's a hearsay and a lot of officers aren't expert. Now, if the uh, officer um, has gone to uh, you know, a top traffic school and is really specialized. But it's his own observation, isn't it? Most of the times the officer has not observed the collision. 
So um, if the uh, officer observed, and, and that would be conclusion, that would just be facts that the officer observed. So the officer's conclusion as to liability, if they're not an expert, then it's just, uh, it's um, uh, not expert uh, testimony because they're not qualified as experts. So very few officers are uh, qualified. Um, but I've had a lot of cases where the police report was against my client. And I have um, uh, believe in my heart of hearts that the facts are not uh, accurate in the, in, the, uh, in the police report and the con conclusion of the officer, uh, officer is not accurate. And uh, the insurance companies will use the police report, if, especially if it's against the plaintiff, uh, in settlement negotiations. So uh, it makes it more difficult to settle, but if we go to trial, and I'm not afraid to go to trial, uh, in the end, the police report's not coming in, and I've um, turned many cases around. Uh, either through settlement or trial, where the police report was against my client. Good for you. You're a good attorney to go to in case someone has an accident, Please. right? Um, well, we wish you a lot of luck. Trial is set for September, correct? September 11th, 2023. Okay. And keep us posted. I said thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.